With the numbers in hand, there is no doubt. Poland is experiencing the best era in its entire history. Since 1989, when it became the first country in the world to completely abandon communism, Poland has been experiencing an economic miracle. 1991, not exactly yesterday, was the last strictly bad year for the Polish economy until the arrival of the coronavirus. While in the rest of Europe, there have been many ups and downs along the way, since 1992, the Polish economy has grown each and every year at an annual average rate of over 4%. Neither the Asian crisis, nor the dot-com crisis, nor the Great Recession, nor the European debt crisis have made a dent in the economic foundations of Poland. Man, capitalism has a lot of crises. And even now, the impact of the coronavirus seems to be moderate. Poland's economy to recover quickly after coronavirus crisis. IMF Polski Radio. This is precisely why, in terms of purchasing power parity, that is, taking price levels as a reference, the Polish per capita income is already practically at the level of Portugal and very close to that of Spain. To give you an idea, since the fall of communism, the size of the Polish economy has increased eightfold. And it's not just the GDP. All indicators have improved significantly. Until the impact of the coronavirus, exports were going from strength to strength. Job creation was breaking records almost every new year. And, as another example, the productivity of Polish workers has increased by a factor of three since 1993. This is something like we talked about here in a past video on visual politic. In a way, Poland is becoming something like the new Germany of Europe. Maybe that is not the best example. But what it is, is a new industrial and export power. And all of this is a very, very different scenario to where it was in 1989. The Red Boot. You see, my friends, between 1945 and 1989, that is, for almost 45 long years, Poland was under the control of the Soviet Union. During all that time, the Poles could not choose the type of government nor the political, economic or social model of their country. Everything, absolutely everything, was imposed from Moscow through the Communist Party of Poland, the so-called Polish United Workers' Party. However, hold on a moment, because even with all that, it's clear that the system in Poland was one of the least extreme or totalitarian east of the Iron Curtain. There were several reasons for this, including international pressure, the fact that Poles felt themselves to be mostly Central European citizens, and because civil society was stronger, or rather, that it existed in some way. And that was already saying a lot. In addition, the Catholic Church had a lot of influence in the country. And you could say that in some way it gave shelter to very different ideas from those that came from Moscow. Well, the point is that all these elements allowed for some opposition to exist in the then Polish People's Republic, for movements such as the Solidarity Union to emerge, for land to be barely collectivised, or even for the Polish authorities to try their luck with the introduction of market socialism, a political approach that consisted of trying to apply market principles to centrally planned economies. Which, in this case, didn't really work all that well. However, despite everything, despite having a less radical or totalitarian regime, the 70s and 80s were also very hard years, both politically and economically. For example, in the late 1980s, the most popular expression was Ni ma, there's none. It was an expression that was repeated over and over and over again in the stores, in the kiosks and in the taverns, because the lack of the most basic products was so widespread. And, if Nima was perhaps the most popular, or at least the most repeated expression, one of the main activities in daily life was queuing. People spent hours and hours in long lines waiting to buy some product that was rumoured to have arrived at that establishment. It seems that we either have long lines for no food, or long lines for food they can't afford. It is difficult to find a witness account about life in socialist Poland that does not refer precisely to these immense queues. It is something that has been burned into the collective imagination. Then. On top of the lack of products of all kinds, the long queues and the electricity and water cuts, which were relatively frequent, the problem of inflation that practically bordered on hyperinflation levels, that appeared at the end of the 1980s. You see, my friends, almost 45 years after the Soviet-inspired socialist model was first introduced, the Polish economy was simply shattered. But at this point, you're probably thinking, but Grant, if this was the situation in Poland in the late 1980s, how could things change so quickly? How did Poland go from being a practically ruined economy to becoming one of the greatest economic miracles in Europe in the last 50 years? How did the Poles manage to make the leap from communism to capitalism? If you want to know more, Listen up. The Transformation, the Balcerowicz Plan. 
The economic crisis, the growing opposition and the openness to the West promoted by Mikhail Gorbachev ended up causing all the communist regimes to begin falling apart, one by one. Poland was one of the first. On the 1st of January 1990, the first technically post-communist government began to implement a revolutionary reform plan to change the country from top to bottom. We are talking about one of the most revolutionary and profound economic reform programs ever undertaken in the world. And what was their goal? To transform as quickly as possible an economy based on socialism, central planning and state ownership of the means of production into a pure capitalist economy. It was known as the Balserowitz Plan in honour of Lesnik Balserowitz, Minister of Finance at the time, the architect and ideologue of this radical transformation. Lesnik Balkowitz was a young 42-year-old economist who had received his doctorate from the Central School of Planning and Statistics in Warsaw and who had belonged to the powerful Polish United Workers' Party until he decided to leave it in 1981. During his academic studies and research, Balserowitz had read, probably clandestinely, works by Mies and Hayek concerning the debate on socialism. It was something he said had a great influence on his way of thinking. Through them, he took on their ideas that property rights and free markets were essential for a rational pricing system to work and for coordinating an economic system. In addition, Balserowitz also studied in detail the reforms of Ludwig Erhard, the German political leader who led the changes that brought about the so-called German economic miracle of the Federal Republic of Germany after the devastation of World War II. Well, weaving together all those threads, Balserowitz set out to turn Poland upside down. And he succeeded. At the end of August 1989, the Prime Minister of the first post-communist government, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, offered Balserowicz the position of Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance in the hopes of reproducing in Poland what had been achieved in the Federal Republic of Germany. You see, my friends, it was the only way not only to escape poverty and regain prosperity, but also to save the fledgling democracy. We are faced with a dramatic alternative. Either we continue to march towards a better economy, or we give up all the achievements already made and return to chaos. Leszek Balserowicz, before the Polish parliament while arguing for his adjustment plan. Remember that, at the time, the collapse of the old communist political systems was becoming an even more acute crisis. In just two years, industrial production in Poland had fallen by almost 40%. Hyperinflation was looming, and almost 1.5 million people had lost their jobs. The collapse was total, and scarcity was the most common denominator. But having said that, what exactly was the plan that was designed to save Poland? You see, the Balserowitz plan sought to do many things at once. On the 6th of October 1989, it was presented on television, and in December, a comprehensive package of 11 laws was passed in Parliament that would change the history of Poland forever. The first was the Act on Financial Economy within State-Owned Companies. And, remember that, at the time, state-owned companies dominated the vast majority of the Polish economy. An example of this law was that it required companies to be managed according to market criteria and allowed large public companies to declare bankruptcy. If they were not self-sufficient, they would have to be reorganized or liquidated. Then the second law was the Act on Banking Law that, among other things, prohibited the central bank from financing the government's deficit and greatly restricted the creation of new money. In other words, it stopped the banknote printing machine in its tracks. Next came the Act on Credits and the Act on Taxation of Excessive Wage Rise, which eliminated the privileges public enterprises had to receive credits and prevented public wages from growing excessively. The new tax law introduced, among other changes, a common taxation for all companies by abolishing the surcharges and special taxes that were imposed on private companies and by eliminating the privileges that public corporations had. Foreign direct investment, exports, imports, profit repatriation, capital inflow and outflow, and the conversion of the national currency, the zloty, into foreign currency were also all almost completely liberalized. And the Act on Customs Law created a single, uniform rate applicable to all companies, public or private. And not only that, price controls were also eliminated, along with many of the subsidies that the state was distributing everywhere. The labor market was made more flexible, and even for the most distrustful foreign investors, a 100% guarantee of the investment was established in case of expropriation. And of course, a plan was put in place to privatize public companies and many of the government's properties. All this was set in motion practically overnight. And although it may be surprising to you, the support for the measures, which in many cases was going to involve many difficulties for a considerable time, was enormous. To give you an idea, at that time, the perception that Polish citizens had was that the only thing keeping them from prosperity was the communist system. So the faster it was overthrown and replaced, the better it would be for everyone. Of course, at this point, many of you may be wondering, okay, 
Okay, this is all well and good, but these economies were based on public ownership. Most of the productive factors belong to the state. So in other words, what on earth happened to these public trading centers? Well, let's take a look at that right now. The Public Giants. It is clear that the dominance of public companies in Poland in 1989 was almost total. We are talking about a hardcore model of communism. Precisely because of this, initially there were some if not most, economists and analysts who consider that the key step in the transition of these countries would be the transformation of the public sector. As some of you may know, public companies tend to have different problems to private ones. Problems with incentives, exchange rates, costs, etc. For example, let's take a look at the case of the Polish shipyards. Polish shipyards were controlled by a central planning agencies. They did not have a global approach to ensure workloads. Each shipyard built all kinds of ships. In other words, they were not specialized and were also inefficient. They also had very inflated cost structures and many more employees than they actually needed. The result was that they were money losing machines whose upkeep cost the state a fortune because they depended not on selling ships, but on government subsidies. And of course, the problem is that turning such a hulking ship around is difficult. Managers were used to dealing with state bureaucrats, not to competing in the market and winning contracts. Productivity was at rock bottom. In fact, less than a quarter of the productivity of shipyards in other countries like South Korea, Japan, or even China. Incentives were there to maintain the model, not to change it, and so on. In any case, the point was that, yes, Poland implemented a privatization and restructuring plan. However, the most striking thing about this particular model is that in the transition, all of this was almost irrelevant. You see, the reforms promoted in the Balserowicz plan generated such dynamism that in the end, the big drivers of the change were the new, small and medium enterprises that suddenly sprouted like mushrooms. While the restructuring and privatization of the large public giants advanced slowly, the new private economy took off so strongly that by 1994, about 2 million private companies and businesses were already responsible for almost half of all non-agricultural employment in the country. And my friends, the results are clear. Check this out. The results. Top marks, outstanding, definitely an honorable mention. This is the grade we'd give to the transformation of Poland. You see, as it turned out, the crisis resulting from the change of model was very short-lived. Despite the collapse of almost all the country's institutions, in barely six years, the GDP had already recovered completely. And Poland then began a period of uninterrupted growth that has only been slowed down occasionally by the coronavirus, almost 30 years later. By 1999, Poland's GDP was already 20% higher than it had been in 1989, and business activity was skyrocketing. And it wasn't only commercial activity. Foreign direct investment began to pour into the country in huge quantities. In 1989, for example, Poland attracted no less than 40% of all foreign direct investment flows into Eastern Europe. These companies you see on screen were some of the multinationals that invested the most in the country. Anyway, my friends, this is how Poland's success story began, which now sees it closer to countries like Portugal or even Spain 30 years on. This is how Poland overcame communism by undergoing a kind of overnight shock therapy. However, the reforms continued, including a comprehensive healthcare reform in 1999 based on private service providers, as well as a complete reform of the pension system where capitalization elements were introduced. But perhaps the thing that is most striking in the case of Poland is that no government, no one has reversed the pro-market reforms that have been pushed by previous governments. Not bad, right? But having given you the overview, it's now over to you. What do you think of such abrupt changes? Do you think that the Polish model could serve in some way as a reference for many countries with similar problems? Leave your answer in the comments below. So we really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Also, don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not my dulcet tones. Finally, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.